Hi, Johan. Johan, good to see you again. Uh, excited yeah. about this conversation. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, and welcome back. Um, you are a returning guest to the show, so I think I must give you some award or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not many of us. <laughs> yeah, I think we spoke about a year ago. Um, you were our first um, first person on the show, so it's really nice to get you back. Thanks. It's super to see you again, Ron. Thank you. Cool. So maybe just for an introduction to our new listeners. Um, so Johan is a global thought leader on artificial intelligence, and he's the founder of AIforbusiness.net. So Johan, maybe for our new viewers, in your own words, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what work you do. Super, Ron. Thank you. I often say when I speak about this technology, I do it as a father more than a technologist. I've got a, a 10 year old and and since he was little, I've been wondering about what future we might create mm. with this new era of technology if we don't regulate it, we don't do it ethically and so forth. So a lot of my work over the last, I would say, almost decade has been around well, both the business applications. So there's some consulting work that I do with large corporates, a lot of writing and speaking. But what really drives me is what are the impact on people? Uh, we cannot just solely have a technological conversation. We need to think about our workforce, our children, and the likes. So I do some academic work with universities and tertiary education, um, and yeah, just a lot of conference speaking. Uh, what I often do is where uh, I'll be invited to board meetings, for instance, and, and speak to the board members because the the ownership of this technology sits at that level, not just with the technologists. Uh, so yeah, yes. passionate about Africa, South Africa, my child. And let's do this right. Nice, nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I guess if anybody wants to reach out to you to see how they can help your businesses or how you can help their business, um, we'll have your contact information at the end of the show. Thank you. So today I would like to talk about two topics. And I think you recently wrote in the, um, was it the business? Business, business day. day. Yes. Business day. Yeah. And I thought... Um, Maybe we could talk a little bit about these two topics and also the intersection between these topics. So the first one is really about the, the EU's AI Act. Mm. Um, the second being quantum computing. Mm. And then I would like to explore some ideas with you when AI and quantum computing intersect. Yes. What's going to happen? Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, so not too long ago, the EU, um, they sort of achieved consensus on uh, moving forward with this legislative framework on artificial intelligence. What are some of the sort of key components of this EU AI Act and why has it been getting so much attention? Mm. Ron, just maybe just to step back and, and some mm. context. It's the most most powerful technology we've ever created. It's permeating our lives. If you have a smartphone, yeah. almost everything is AI. Even our banks are using AI to make automated decisioning on uh, credit and, and the like. So if we think it's not here and it's not forming part of almost everything we do, then we're mistaken. Because it's so powerful, is the question is, what do we do when it gets out of hand and when we can no longer control it? And there are a lot of dangers around AI, which we can maybe unpack, especially around deep fake technology and deception and, and fake news and the like. And, and for a long time, there wasn't any regulatory framework or initiatives around it. And mm. I think, you know, I often say we, you know, we typically in the West, when we talk about time, we talk about BC and AD. But I, I almost want to say we now talk about pre and post chat GPT, because over the last year and a half, it's really brought the AI conversation mainstream. It's no longer just in the domain of technologists. Um, and yes. people are getting familiar with it. They're playing with it. They're either fearing it or they're thinking it's the best things in sliced bread. And both those extremes are very dangerous. But now, how do we regulate it given the danger it poses? You know, and, and I think we, even you and I might have spoken about this. Um, you know, when, when driving cars became more popular, suddenly we realized we needed seat belts, seat belts mm -hmm. because they were accidents. And that's the thing, regulation follows innovation. Um, and 
but now this innovation is happening at such a pace. Not only are regulators pretty much far behind it, they're going to keep on falling more and more behind. So, right. so there's a lot of things that we hear from the US, from the White House. Uh, the EU has really made a lot of progress, as you've alluded to. They finally got some consent around the member countries. Look, it'll only really be an act in law in about a year or two. Mm. But what, what it excites me about is that I think the framework is really good enough as an example for other areas in the world and other countries to follow suit. Uh, there's a lot of things around um, that framework. Now, the other challenge is between innovation and regulation. And a lot of the complaints and objections the EU got were from technology companies that say, you know, this train has left the station. This AI thing is going to keep on happening. You can't stop us. Stop us. Because the other concern with nation states is to stay ahead of the race against their enemies, like the race between China and Europe and the US, for instance. So you can't just rein it in because China is not going to regulate it like the EU. They're going to just go all the way with this technology. Mm. If you think of your, your military installations, um, your, your, your um, security, your privacy in your country, you can't stop this. But there are some dangers that we have to stop. Um, some of the, the EU Act relates to privacy, like GDPR or Papua here in South Africa. Um, yes. Although those regulatory frameworks, even though they're fairly good for privacy, they, they're quite inadequate for, for AI. Maybe one of the points in the proposed AI Act that I like the most is the visibility of what happens. Now, in other words, if I apply for a loan or for credit and my bank declines it, and it'll typically be because of an automated decisioning system. And those systems are accurate. They're often a lot more efficient and accurate than humans. But we know that there are biases potentially in the data maybe because of my gender or my ethnicity or where I live, that will make the application to be declined. And what the EU AI Act says that as a consumer, I have the right to contact my bank and say, explain to me how the AI oh, got to this decision mm -hmm. and can we redo it? In fact, can a human now do it? Give me the reasons, it's visibility. And I think that's a good thing. Now, I think what banks and other organizations will struggle with is most likely all the queries that will come their way. They will need a separate mm. contact center potentially for all these queries. But I, it's, it's really about consumer protection. Um, you know, for instance, if I phone a bank or a telco and I'm speaking to a conversational AI chatbot, I think I should be notified because th these chatbots are so accurate that in yes. some cases you could you don't even know it's not a human. I mean, even their mannerisms, they will mm and ah and, and laugh at your jokes and stuff. But do we, should we not have the option at the beginning of the call to hear, you are going to speak to a non-human intelligence. Mm -hmm. And if at any time during the call you want to press hash, you will go through to a human. For now, I'm not too worried about this regulation in the sense of it's not super dangerous yet. I'm worried about 20 or 30 years from now with our children given where this technology is going. So if we don't steer the ship in the right direction now, we will have a lot of problems. But I think I've said a lot. I just want to pause there for now. Right? Yeah, because I was I was just thinking as you were speaking, the, the EU now has some regulations and I think the I think the term is also which is used is transparency. So being able to explain how AI made decisions. Um, and I was remembering a demo from Google Maybe a year or two ago, we where an AI made a appointment for a, I think it was for a haircut or something, um, and it was so realistic because, as you said, they put those nuances in. Um, so this act is going to try to sort of protect the consumers, and I guess in the financial services space, you're talking about the loan applications and sort of the risk pieces. How do you think this act is going to? play out globally? Um, yeah. Is it going to influence other AI governance and implementations? Where do you see this going globally? Because this, I guess, is primarily contained within the EU at this stage. Absolutely. Look, hopefully it is an example for other countries. I, I think a lot of governments, if not almost all governments around the world, are asleep at the wheel. They don't understand this technology. 
Um, they, like in our country, they are keeping the lights or trying to keep the lights on. I don't even know if, they, if I have the luxury and the time to think about 4IR because keeping yes. the lights on is a second industrial revolution challenge. You know, we should have been so far beyond that by now. Um, and, and that's where there are some initiatives, even here, luckily, it's very small, where governments reaching out to industry, to universities, especially with great research labs and research centers and say, it, it has to be driven by the government, but it cannot be solely the government. They need the expertise in the country. So I, I would like to think that many countries will follow suit. Now, to give an idea, the and I think it was Oxford University who released the AI Readiness Index. Uh, and this is a while ago. And if my memory serves me well, South Africa is 169th on the global AI readiness list. Mm, mm. And again, if memory serves me well, we are only 12th from an African point of view. Even countries like Kenya and Nigeria and Mauritius are way ahead of us. Hopefully, the adoption will take place. Again, the problem with regulation across the decades is it's only when something goes really, really wrong that yes. people wake up to regulate it. It's seatbelts is one example, but the power of this technology is when they do wake up, is it not already too late? So it's it's trying to work with and encourage government. Uh, we need AI um, innovation centers driven by government, bring in the best minds, the best expertise. It should be funded by government. There are some signs that our government is slowly waking up to it, but I'm sorry if I'm a bit pessimistic about the reality of that really happening quickly enough. But yes, okay, hopefully no. the EU is showing the way for others to follow. Ron. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I think that example of us trying to keep the lights on, um, which is, I guess, even could potentially be more accelerating and exponential uh, when combined with AI is quantum computing. So what in your understanding and perspective is the difference between sort of our traditional silicon based um, architecture and quantum computing? And and why does the industry see this as a sort of massive paradigm shift if we can move to quantum versus silicon based architecture? I find it difficult to explain, and it could be that I myself don't entirely understand it yet, but I'll give you my view and what I've read and seen so far. If if you think of a two-dimensional world, you know, you look at a, a picture on a paper, and the shift between that and a three-dimensional world where you can see depth and you can rotate the picture around, in a way, that is the shift between normal silicon-based computing and quantum. You know, we work in, in digits, ones and zeros. That's how all our computers are working. We're working with silicon-based chips, and there we can speak about the so-called Moore's Law that says every few months the, the amount of transistors you can put on a chip doubles. But then the question is, I mean, no matter how good we get at this, no matter if it's nanometer size transistors on a chip, at some stage we're going to just run out of space. We just cannot put more transistors on a chip. Yeah, yes. Quantum doesn't work with ones and zeros. It's in a totally different dimension. And, and uh, sometimes I draw this picture uh, on a whiteboard. I would say, here's a one and here's a zero, and this is digital computing. But what if you now make it a three-dimensional picture where the ones and zeros form a, uh, a square, but in three dimensions? Mm -hmm. You know, So now you get multiple dimensions. In, in silicon-based computing, it can either be a one or a zero. In quantum computing, it can both be a one and a zero at the same time. So the effect of that means that the ability to process data and churn out results and make decisions is at a hundred million fold more powerful than traditional mm -hmm. computing. The challenge with quantum computing is to democratize it because it's extremely expensive. It is still only um, kind of limited to some big universities or maybe somewhere in China or, or Google's got one or two as well. And the other challenge is that because the way it works is that you need to encase this computer in a temperature of about minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit because of the heat that generates. Mm. So I don't think it will be soon for me to go buy a quantum computer at uh, Incredible Connection, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wanting to ask, can I buy one at the next Black Friday? But it seems <laughs> we're a bit off from that. 
Yeah, exactly. Look, unless you have an incredible fridge and $100 million, I don't know. <laughs> but but the challenge is, that I think one of the biggest challenges posed by quantum computing and the, the, the processing power that we say uh, today's, uh, today's most powerful silicon-based computers will take, say, 40 minutes to do something that's very complex, mm -hmm. where a quantum computer can maybe do it in nanoseconds. So encryption is potentially our biggest challenge because... Yes. It seems that there's no encryption, whether it's the National Security Agency, the Pentagon, any of our businesses, any of our phones, that the quantum computer cannot break in split seconds. And I don't know if we will have an antivirus or a, a, a security patch of sorts for quantum computing. IBM is doing some work around that, but it's going to be a huge challenge. Now, remember, like all technology, the double-edged sword, the potential for mm. medical research, for education, for solving some of our biggest environmental problems is immense. But I think that if, you know, we're already struggling with privacy, but what if our national security is breached so quickly and the results that that could have because of quantum computing? Yes. Um and I guess if you if you if we start thinking about combining artificial intelligence, which is power hungry and processing capability hungry, and you now put it on some quantum technology that's orders of magnitude faster, that's a really scary thought in terms of this exponential growth we're already seeing with AI. We we try and catch up, as you said, maybe we're asleep at the wheel and the EU AI Act came here after AI was really democratized. Um, if you sort of think, do we actually already need to start creating a quantum act? We if you're talking about the privacy and security, all of those aspects and putting AI on top of it, it feels like we should be doing one already. Exactly. You're so right, Ron. Look, we're so far behind on what I can call normal AI, although that's most likely not the right term. We're not even close to even thinking about quantum. And I think a lot of people think quantum computing is still in the realm of science fiction, and it's not. But you're right, if you think, because what does AI do? AI's main tenets, if you would, is prediction, pattern recognition, um, and, other th and decision making. That's how it differs from just normal automation uh, platforms. But if we say so as a government, you know, we've got what, I don't know, 48 or 52 million people. And if we can harvest enough data on them, especially through their mobile phones, I think one of currently the um, limits for a lot of AI platforms is, like you said, the computing power behind it. We're mm -hmm. building massive data centers, producing a great deal of carbon and heat, which is a problem. It, it's a massive problem. Just to give you an example, um, I read somewhere when OpenAI trained ChatGPT before it was released. They consumed, if I remember correctly, 1,250 kilowatt hours of power, mm. and they released 550 tons of carbon. That's what that data center churned out just to train this model. And now this model is being used a million times more by people all over the world, and we've got BARD, and we've got Gemini, and who knows what. So can you imagine what all these data centers are doing to our environment, and maybe there is quantum computing will be our friend in that it needs the the, the coolness, yes, yes. etc. But if you take this incredibly power predictive technology on top of a quantum computer, what it can do in split seconds is, I I think, you know, uh, just for maybe listeners or viewers that don't know, theoretically, what we are currently in the era of artificial narrow intelligence, which means it can, to some extent, do what we can do from an intelligence point of view. The next step will be artificial general intelligence and then super intelligence, which is the doomsday event. But I think quantum computing is what will take us into artificial general intelligence. Then it opens up a can of worms around it really is smarter than us. It really can do almost any job we can do, and so forth. And then we're sitting with a hot potato of sorts, you know. <laughs> yeah, are, are we quick enough to to think about the impact of what quantum and AI can do together? Because generally, humans tend to think sort of in a linear pattern, but hmm. it's like AI is on its own exponential curve already, and now adding quantum to it, it's 
Mm. Should we just stop thinking about this and wait and see? <laughs> Look, I don't know what we must wait for because it's somewhat unknown. Yeah. But what if we are just too late? What if we are already too late? You know, a, a great book is Nick Bostrom's book, Super Intelligence. I think he's with Oxford. Two or three years ago, and, and it's a heavy book to read. Um, but he predicts some things there that's really scary. And then, of course, then the other person who's maybe my favorite author to read or listen to is Yuval Noah Harari, you know, Sapiens and Homo Deus. And it's also interesting that the, the two of them and others form a group of the most profound thinkers in AI, and they're not technologists, they're historians and philosophers. Yes, yes. Mm. Because we have to think about what it means to be human. You know, the, the, the human and AI combination is our future. And yeah, we talk about brain computer interface technology, Neuralink, Elon Musk, and others are doing a lot around that. Again, potential around Alzheimer's and blindness and what that chip in your brain could maybe fix. But, you know, my most private part is my are my thoughts. And what if my thoughts are not mine anymore, but it's influenced and dictated by a platform that's controlled by who? The Googles of the world or the governments of the world. It's the end of democracy, as imperfect as it is. It's the end of a lot of things. And, and a question I often ask, and if just quickly, Sedgway, but I'll come back to the point. Mm -hmm. About between 50 and 80,000 years ago, we Homo sapiens got the overhand over Neanderthals and other hominoid species. Many reasons for that. It's, uh, I think, our use of language. It's the development of our neocortex. It's the ability to imagine. You know, animals can't imagine. Animals have fight or flight. But we mm -hmm. create businesses and we write books because we can imagine things that don't exist and then work at creating it. And, and eventually Neanderthals died out, although some of us uh, share about 2% Neanderthal DNA today still. But we are now at a, at a tipping point in our history where a new hominoid species will be created. And this is no longer an evolutionary process. This is we who are creating it. Yes. And this will be human-like AI-infused robots. And then the philosophical question is, I mean, we've had implants for years, pacemakers and the like. But if, if it's more edge or AI computed um, smart devices in my body and in my brain in particular, where is the tipping point where I stop being homo sapien, but I'm something else? Some philosophers call it homo artificialis, where my longevity is six times more than today. Mm, yes. My intelligence is as smart as chat GPT can be, etc. And, and where Yuval Harari talks about it is he says we are going to create a useless class of people, not just because we're out automating all the jobs pretty much, but there will be a small percentage of humans with the wealth and the means through implants to become super intelligent beings, and the rest of us will not. So will we again get to a point where a new species outperforms the old species mm -hmm. that dies out. And we have to talk about these things. I know it sounds far-fetched for many people, but this mm -hmm. is where we're heading to at the moment. And what quantum will do, it will exponentially increase the, the time frame around achieving time some of to these get things. To that, yes. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I guess that's that's probably what we need to talk about more, is what does it mean to be human? How can we not get into a situation where we only give this capabilities to some people rather than necessarily trying to create human guardrails for this technology. Mm -hmm. If we're having those types of discussions, then I guess as a species, we can think of what's next and take advantage of that. Absolutely. But this is serious stuff. It's not armchair philosophy. This is our kids and their kids. We, mm -hmm. we might not while you and I are still on Earth really see the real impact of all this stuff. I think we'll see some of it, but it's our children and theirs. And I often think if they, in 30 or 40 or 50 years from now, mm -hmm. write a letter back to us, what will they say? What will they, they blame us? And I'm talking about us as a collective because we all only have so much influence. Yes. Are we asleep at the wheel as a collective? And I think we are. Can this signal the end of humanity? It probably will. And uh, so mm -hmm. this is serious stuff to talk about, you know. Yes, <laughs> but I guess as you said, we we I'm not going to buy a quantum computing 
uh, at the next Black Friday sale. No. <laughs> but it feels to me very similar to where we were with AI. AI has been around quite a long time. Um, it's gone through some winters and then there was some uptake. And then a year or two ago, uh, there was this pivot event where it got so democratized, everybody could start using it. It feels quantum is at that same level at this stage. Yeah, it's there. People are doing research. Um, it's this massive cold device that looks like a chandelier to me. Yes. Um, do you think, and maybe AI is going to sort of help, do, when do you think that pivot point is where quantum computing is going to become real at a big scale? Yeah. Look, it'll follow all of our innovations for thousands of years. It's very unique. It's very expensive. It's very rare. Mm. People who design it will not share it because of the power it gives them. And then over time, and, and often not a lot of time, that innovation becomes cheaper to produce, cheaper to maintain, uh, easier to manufacture, um, easier to use. So quantum could be, although the physics around quantum is the trick, you know, it's I can't just hear in my garage have a quantum computer without the unique situation and environmental conditions for it. But we might never get to a point where I will have a quantum computer in my house. But we will get to a point where most large businesses will and most governments will have access to it. Um, mm. When that will happen, I think it's around the, the physics and, and how we can solve the physics around it. But if we trace it to most of our innovations, we are on that trajectory. Cheaper, easier, yes, yes. more democratized. Yes. And, and I think at the rate of change, it won't be 50 years. It will probably be 10. It's around the corner. Yes. Yeah, AI is almost helping the acceleration because if you look at some of the uh, new scientific discoveries um, in terms of materials, etc., some of those things wouldn't have been possible in this short period of time. So I almost get a sense that AI is going to help accelerate quantum computing and then the reverse is going to work. And, then, and I guess when fusion power comes online, also probably in the same spectrum of <coughs> developing then we're going to have unlimited power and unlimited general artificial intelligence or super intelligence yes yeah and then you know we have been the most intelligent species on earth for thousands of years although i doubt how intelligent we really are because we're screwing <laughs> this place up but we are now at a pivoting point of we will become the second or third most intelligence beings or species on earth yes, and yes. that threatens our futures and our survival yeah yeah, I guess in the short term, I hope AI and quantum can work together because just to do some basic serverless delivery, we haven't been had water for, for the last two days. So do you think AI and quantum computing is going to help with managing governments and better service delivery? Uh, it can, but it starts with some common sense and good leadership because you can't AI that. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. you can put in very smart devices into the pipes uh, delivering the water. Um, have predictive analytics that will, before it happens, show you where you're going to have a water shortage. I mean, we see this already being used in agriculture, smart farming a lot. But whether the people running the local council or the local or national government will have the foresight and know how, how to even start doing that, I have a lot of doubt about that. AI can solve a lot of those yes. problems, but it can't solve a bad government and bad leadership and lack of foresight. <laughs> Thank you, Johan. <laughs> Maybe just to sort of end up on a on a sort of positive note again, the the potential of AI and quantum computing to solve some of our biggest challenges. What do you see are some of the things that this technology is going to help us as humankind going forward? Look, I think definitely around education. And, and already, I think some of the best use cases for AI from an AI for good point of view is around hyper-personalized education. So based on the data that the mm. platform hopefully responsibly harvests on me, maybe if it's a virtual training, my eye movements, how my brain works, determining whether I learn better through pictures or words. In other words, rather give me a mind map than an audio book or, or the other way around. And to really, especially as network coverage and the cost of smart devices um, changes that people in rural areas and villages can have in their hand the best education in the world 
tailored for their unique learning yes, needs. Yes. That's definitely it. And the other one is, is healthcare, which is definitely not democratized across the world, but cost of it in certain areas of the world, access to it. And here we can talk about drones delivering blood or other device or medical emergency things to a village, to a person. Also hyper-personalized medicine, because maybe I can send a blood sample yes. or even upload that blood sample into a little IoT device. And then in a sh very short time, that specific medicine for my DNA is produced in a lab by AI and sent to me by a drone. Um, so I think there are definitely some of the benefits. Also wealth creation and uh, um, you know alleviating poverty, the ability to create digital online kind of jobs. Um, Definitely, those potentials are there. Yes, Sadly, yes. and I know I sound like a pessimist, given human nature, we've already always taken technological innovation and it normally benefits the few in power and it doesn't benefit at large scale those who are not in power. And hopefully we as humans will change that, but we will have to wait and see with this new era of technology what we are going to do because we are tribal and selfish beings. And technology will not take that out of our nature. You know? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's 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 talking about that alignment problem that the guys are trying to solve. But I guess we're going to have to talk about this again because there's so much so much to talk about. Absolutely. Johan, thank you very much for your time today. Um, I look forward to um, speaking to you again. And if anybody would like to contact Johan, I'm going to leave his contact details at the end of the show. Please reach out to him if you've got any any need for some of the services and um, to help you move forward. Thanks, Johan.